Hello everyone. Welcome to this morning's episode. Inquiries into the ever-present mind, or another way of saying it, is the ever-present experiencer. I find that we human beings have an obligation to perform on the stage that existence has given to us. And that stage is recently being discovered more and more as history progresses to have an internal extension. It's as if life is not just happening in front of your eyes. It is also being valued behind them. What does that mean? That means the sight of man is kept in two worlds. The simultaneity of the witness and the simultaneity of the witnessed. You see, many human beings noticed that they were observing their biological body. Eventually, their philosophical kind of quests took them, their searches took them to a wondering of how can I be what I am aware of? How can I be what I observe? In other words, objective realm like a wrestling tag team tags in the subjective realm. And any time your body, if you notice, if your body is used to a certain movement and it suddenly stops, the mind is going to move. You see, the mind, I find, is not just a pattern generator, but it's a pattern maintainer. The patterns that come to us now is ones that are found in the linguistic simulation. The language of the world is giving shape behind man's eyes. And so I noticed that there is many, many fields of study done. Much study has been done on what is in front of our eyes. But what is behind our eyes, we will find, will not have it after some point, a dualistic reference point. That means Mr. Within is kind of suggesting that we human beings, if we were to truly look at what we were, a sort of, you can say it's like a, a, a component, a part of the moment is not tangible. The presence of attention as an instantaneous awareness is the simplicity of being. From the simplicity of being, there comes potentials. That means when I wonder about what I'm going to do tomorrow, sometimes there's views, sometimes there isn't. Sometimes the, the, the person's vision is clouded, sometimes it is not. You know, this is why I say also the inner realm appears like just like how you can't control external weather. Sometimes you may not be able to control inner weather, but you can at least observe the weather when it happens. I want to, dear listener, I want to read for you um, certain quotations from these ancient um, uh, Vedic texts, ancient Indian kind of, you can say, mythological metaphysics.
These are not just from this list of quotes that I found. It's, um, <clears throat> it's from the Upanishads and the Vedas. So I'm going to read it for you. Um, we have to consider the, this was, um, these are ancient books. So we can say they are creative artifacts on some level, uh, artifacts of literature. But um, anyways, I'm going to continue. Arathara Veda tells us, Most humbly we bow to you, O Supreme Lord. At your command moves the mighty wheel of time. You are eternal and beyond eternity. So in, in the Arathara Veda, we can see devotion to the ultimate. In the Yajur Veda, it says the one who loves all intensely begins perceiving in all living beings a part of himself. He becomes a lover of all, a part and parcel of the universal joy. He flows with the stream of happiness and is enriched by each soul. In other words, with intense love, when you give, uh, when you behave externally, you uh, uh, the human being must consider that it, it it does have an influence on the personal dimension. So the more freedom you give to your world, the more freedom actually your psychology finds. Anyways, in the Rig Veda, let's continue this uh, quote tunnel. Um, Rig, uh, Rig, the Rig Veda says the human body is the temple of God. One who kindles the light of awareness within gets true light. The sacred flame of your inner shrine is constantly bright. The experience of unity is the fulfillment of human endeavors. The mysteries of life are revealed. You see, what I find it interesting, guys, before I continue, uh, experience, and it's very kind of obvious to kind of see why, because technology hadn't evolved. So what was the technology accessible? The biological experience, this, the, uh, the projections of the biological experience. The Rig Veda, there's another quote that says, Sing the song of celestial love, O singer. Oh, this ancient book is asking me to sing, guys. <laughs> <clears throat> sing the song of celestial love, O singer. May the divine fountain of eternal grace and joy enter your soul. May Brahma, the divine one, pluck the strings of your inner soul with his celestial fingers and feel his own presence within. Bless us with a divine voice that we may tune the harp strings of our life to sing songs of love to you. Um, I think I can uh, share a really interesting story here. Of course, it's not uh, directly correlated to the Rig Veda, but there was a figure by the name of Rishi Vyasa. Rishi Vyasa was this next level kind of being. Some people saw him as the incarnation of God in language because he did kind of like a miraculous feat uh, at a time where he was so ahead of his time, he started writing books on trees that have survived till today, on books on leaves. And uh, he wrote eight, 18 of the Puranas. He was guided intuitively by the divine will. And after he writes these 18 Puranas on, on, on the advancement of civilization, of course, he, he's using simple metaphors, but he's keeping important values alive in the Puranas. So anyways, Rishi Vyasa writes these 18 books on leaves back in the day, like, you know, next level writing activity. And he is not satisfied. His intuition feels incomplete. And what he does is in that moment, actually, an angel, as the story says, an angel comes to him. Uh, an angel comes to him and says, Rishi Vyasa, you will not be content until you write about your love of God. So you got to consider that God was a presence of all. So in other words, an angel came to Rishi Vyasa and said, you got to write about the purest experience of the whole cosmos, in other words. <clears throat> and of course, he writes the Srimad Bhagavatam, the Bhagavad Gita. And um, 
It's very profound. It's very, very profound. In other words, the civilization is simply um, existent for the purpose of the archetype. I find what the human experience is, is this constant opening, you know, after certain periods of running, after certain laps around the sun, so the constant opening, uh, how would I say? Think of it this way. You cannot experience a new moment if nothing changes. So the mystics were seeking that ultimate state and the ultimate meant it was beyond everything. So in other words, it's, it, it was a riddle, guys. I'll tell you these poor mystics and yogis, it's like there was a riddle involved and they took it too seriously. So they, I feel they got kind of glitched in the system. Uh, the, the idea was that you cannot, if you pay attention in Zen especially and many yogic practices where they were trying to renounce uh, the material realm. And the reason they were renouncing it is they wanted their attention to be internal, not to be external. But they didn't realize that in some sense you cannot escape the external because then you'll constantly be chasing the internal. So it's not about good and bad at some point in the mystical quest. It becomes about a sort of freedom of the experiencer. It's kind of like um, holding the child's hand until, until it can walk on its own. So simply <clears throat> the mind, um, it's like um, it, we, it oscillates. How can I tell you? When you're younger, life is a playground. When you're older, life is a battlefield. Now this battlefield becomes more multidimensional and what that means is, is believe it or not there's a lot of we can't we don't have enough technology but if we could we would see the sequences of how ideas appear to the person Life is a sequence when I when I wake up and I try to remember yesterday it becomes a remembering a sequence what does that mean? And what's fascinating is uh, some people may have the potential, but me personally, I can't remember all the details of yesterday. I can remember the moments where there, were em there was emotional turbulence. This is why they say passion is powerful, because in, pa in a passionate state of mind, something is important. Why do we have? We have many lovers in history, like Romeo and Juliet is the... Is, is, an, is one accessible to the West. To the East, there was Lely and Majnun. And these were myth, kind of, you can say, lovers that were, uh, their stories were preserved in legend. In both cases, the dudes have passion. <laughs> They're like, they're like dying for the divine love of the girl. But the idea is that it's seeing a truth within an other that is similar to your own and that draws you. So most people don't realize whatever in this life you have been drawn to has actually been part of the phenomenology of how your own mind received the moment. When I say getting to know your mind is important in this life is because it's not really a shaped thing. For example, there's the story of Bodhiharma. Bodhiharma, this Japanese, long story short, he's, he was a patriarch, I believe the fifth patriarch of Buddhism in Japan. He took Buddhism to Japan pretty much. And he finds himself in a moment where this person comes uh, at night and Bodhiharma is in some deep meditation, deep meditation, uh, like a samadhi, you know, pretty much a non ident it's like a non-local moment of being. <clears throat> he's pretty much not being a human in that moment. He's just being the moment of the human. 
So anyways, Bodhiyama is in this deep meditation and this guy comes and it's a foggy night and this guy's waiting for a long time. And one night he sees Bodhiyama gets up from his meditation. And he runs up to him and he's like, Bodhiyama, you got to help me, please. You got to help me. Like some, some kind of like as if some, there's some inner emergency occurring with him. And Bodhiharma is, I think he wasn't like his personality. He hadn't entered the body of his personality yet. But uh, he was like, um, uh, long story short, the guy, Bodhiharma doesn't acknowledge the guy at first. The guy, guys, I'm not making this part up. This is actually like in history. The guy cuts his hand. And he looks at Bodhiharma hand in hand, strangely, and says, like, that was a sign of loyalty back in the day. I don't know why he would do that. But, it, <clears throat> but he totally, he looks at Bodhiharma and says, my mind <clears throat> is restless. Please help me. I haven't slept at all. As if the guy is dying because of insomnia. <laughs> you know? And uh, he looks at Bodhiharma and Bodhiharma eventually says, all right, what's up? Yeah. <laughs> You know, like, <laughs> I could see a modern version of this Bodhiyama being like, Jesus, man, what are you doing? You know, and people are going to be like, Jesus is not here yet. <laughs> no, I'm joking. <clears throat> Bodhiyama says, what is it? And the man looks at Bodhiyama and says, please pacify my mind. And there is this incredible silence as if it's no longer a conversation among two people. It has become a conversation among two un unknown souls. Bodhiyama looks at the man and says, I will. I will pacify your mind. And the man is just like, yes, thank you. But Bodhiyama says, but first, and the guy's like, what? He's like, first, you need to bring your mind in front of me so I pacify it. And this man's like, wait, hold on. And for a second, he just tries to conceptualize how he can bring his mind in front of Bodhiyama to pacify. And he looks around. He looks around this mind that has kept him restless. This mind that was the source of his suffering. He looks around and he's like, Bodhiyama, I can't find it. I can't find my mind. And there's this intense silence. And what Bodhiyama says in this story enlightens this man on the spot. The guy gets enlightened right after. And Bodhiyama looks at him and says, There! Your mind is pacified. And he walks away. And this man for a second is like, whoa, he realizes his suffering didn't exist only because his attention was on it. And it's not that suffering doesn't exist, guys. I'm not trying to say, like, this is, I'm not trying to say, let's act like we're in heaven when we're on earth, actually. The thing is, it's just that certain problems in life are self-generated, self-projected here. That's a better way of saying it. So anyways, guys, I'm going to continue with this uh, quote tunnel of the Upanishads and the Vedas. In the Chandog Chandogya Upanishad, Chandogya Upanishad, it says, Of everything, he is the innermost self. He is the truth. He is the self supreme. In the, oh my God, I don't think I can pronounce this. In the Kaivali, Kaivalyo Upanishad. Kaivalyo Upanishad. It says, meditating on the lotus of your heart. In the center is the untainted. The exquisitely pure. 
clear and sorrowless. The inconceivable, the unmanifest of infinite form, blissful, tranquil, immortal, the womb of Brahma. Okay, okay. Like, <laughs> the guy's getting too, too poetic here. <laughs> What he means is the source of creation. Is not just inconceivable. It is the incon inconceivable. That's the surprise. That's the surprise that whatever man does, in the final moment, there will be a wonder that will be there. Treat every moment of your life as if you are reuniting with an old friend. In the Katha Upanishad, it says those in whose hearts Om, O-M, reverberates, unceasingly are indeed blessed, and deeply loved as one who is the self. The all-knowing self was never born, nor will it die. Beyond cause and effect, this self is eternal and immutable. When the body dies, the self does not die. Sorry guys, this thing was on mute and I was reading and I have no idea if um, <laughs> um, if the last two quotes were heard. Um,
Anyways, I'll continue. <clears throat> I'll read this last one before. O seeker, know the true nature of your soul and identify yourself with it completely. O Lord, may we attain the everlasting consciousness of supreme light and joy. May we resolve to dedicate our life to the service of humankind and up uplift them to divinity. This was from the Yajur Veda. Now, I want to say that any time one considers ever-presence, it means you're wondering about either before the temporary or after the temporary. You know, you don't have to consider the soul just because you, you in some sense think it's the opposite of physicality. There are some beings who their soul is the attributeless presence of their being. So it's like before they do anything, they're already being present in that way. That's how they know it's their nature. Um, Rabindranath Tagore has this quote where he says, I slept and dreamt that life was joy. I awoke and I saw that it was service. I awoke and saw that it was service. I acted. And behold, service was joy. That service is joy is for the first time in the nature of the being's manifestation, the consideration of an unknown collective archetype. The reason I say unknown is because of the vastness of the intelligence. That means I wondered for a long time, why spheres? Why did the cosmos have have why it's like for example if there was god it's like i i'm writing this book called god like spheres and i simply wondered about what is it with these spheres and emptiness <laughs> some people feel it's like hey god you know is is, is existence like finished you know and seems not You know what I find fascinating? We consider the human being as a certain process of change in space and time. But I have always wondered that individuals die in this world. And so what can the individual do in the face of the inevitable void? This is why you kind of, after some point, I find, it's like the more laps you take around the sun, the more you see the humanity that is being left behind. There's this quote that's in ancient Sanskrit. It says, look to this day, for it is life, the very breath of life. In its brief course lie all the realities of your existence, the bliss of growth, the glory of action, the splendor of beauty. For yesterday is only a dream and tomorrow is but a vision, but today well lived makes everything yesterday a dream. <coughs> I'll read that again. <coughs> For yesterday is only a dream and tomorrow is but a vision, but today well lived makes every yesterday a dream of happiness and every tomorrow a vision of hope. Look well, therefore, to this day. It's a really splendid quote, guys, because simply the quote is saying, in every breath that you're taking is the opportunity to be able to consider many dimensions, many realities. Your successes, your failures, your species' successes and failures, all of them being considered in a conscious moment where the biology is kept by the breath. Sometimes uh, I, I am like, there was a time I considered it, I sat down and um, I began to notice how fragile the human body is. 
and I notice that in this world there is of course turbulence <clears throat> and it seems that it's a journey you know I thought it was all about the destination that kind of messed up my life you know I, I realize it's about the journey it's about quality of every moment you know because if you only care for the destination you won't care how you get to the destination but how you get to the destination is the time of life There's no way I can pronounce this. This is becoming more challenging, guys. <laughs> but from this text called Sav Sav uh, Savarajya Siddhi, it says the highest self, all endless bliss, the unconditioned limitless consciousness being realized, whether through the great texts or through yoga, in all experience, whatever, let one lose himself in the ecstasy of realization. For he has forever lost all touch with bondage of every description. Exactly. There's, there's a moment that comes where the human being puts down language and in doing so cannot be a creature of thought anymore. That moment is very supreme. And if you're somehow a human being who has become observant of this stuff, you will realize life is not about finding truth. Life is about efficient journey. That means it's like the laws of society should not be based on static values. They should be in accordance to dynamic vision. As if suddenly there came this realization that these 8 billion creatures, every day that they're alive, they're alive once in that day. All the thoughts of that day are occurring once. For me, life is, is it's like, how can I even define myself where there has been so many views on myself in every moment of my life. This is why after some point I noticed it that I, I called it my simply it, like before people like I, I have never had an experience of soul where it's like a ghost leaving the body and like oh yeah going to another body. <laughs> but it's, it's not something like that. That, 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 that is a semi-mental dimension. You see, the mind owns a part of the body before the body wa wavers. This is why the person's body dies, but the witness remains. When the witness remains, it has to be reminded. So the mind, you can say it's, um, think of it this way. Human existence Is a very tiny percentage of what is actually happening as your moment of being. This is why I say true intelligence cannot be measured because it is the abidance by a dynamic rhythm. <clears throat> Let's keep going with this code tunnel, guys. I'm really feeling it. Whoever made this website, like, good, good job. <laughs> This, this, uh, all right, let's try it. Vijnanang, uh, Vij, Vijnan, Vijnanananka. From this text. A particle of its bliss supplies the bliss of the whole universe. Everything becomes enlightened in its light. All else, uh, all else appears worthless after a sight of that essence. I am indeed of this supreme eternal self. Nice. Yeah. After some point, that supreme eternal self is literally an unknown X factor. To the individual mind, truth is always beyond it if it considers it's the truth not being where it is. <clears throat> From the Vivekachudamani... I think I read that right. <laughs> There's, the quote says, The knower catches in the ecstasy of his heart the full light of that Brahman, that divine essence, which is indescribable, all pure bliss, incomparable, transcending time, ever free, beyond desire. Guys, there's too many people around the world that are pointing to an attributeless collective field of intelligence running the show here. Okay, too many people in history are doing it. It's weird. Yeah. <laughs> In the, Mun in the Mundaka Upanishad, it says, bright but hidden, the self dwells in the heart. Everything that moves, breathes, opens and closes, lives in the self. 
He is the source of love and may, and may be known through love but not through thought. He is the goal of life. Attain this goal. So when he says he, guys, you got to understand, it's they're all kind of pointing to this giant X. This giant X is an unknown uh, uh, watcher. A lot of, uh, mis uh, if a psychologist was considering what's going on with these mystics, they would see that they, they, were, they had uh, uh, allowed life to have a sort of value where the unknown evoked the moment. So when I speak, if I want only the known to evoke the moment, I write that down on a piece of paper. But when I want the unknown to evoke the moment, then that becomes something different. To continue, guys, from the Shvetashvatra Upanishad, it says, All is change in the world of the senses, but changeless is the supreme Lord of love. Meditate on Him, be absorbed by Him, wake up from this dream of separateness. I find any time the person wonders about something, it's a sort of movement. Imagine you were a being who was aware of everything in your moment, every tiny change the whole moment's attention would go to. I find it's a, it's a cool idea <clears throat> that human beings have only been experiencing their mind through language and in moments of silence and stillness begin to feel different ways that the, mind, the world moves in their mind. If the person treats their intelligence, uh, that one that is not separate from the world, they will be open to at least witnessing the world. The issue is that what you resist you don't want to see, but what you resist is also a part of everything. It's honestly the evolution of the experiencer as the moment. The Yoga Patanjali Sutra said it was like a transparent orb. This transparent orb on different surfaces uh, gives off different, it's as if it has a different color. 
So you, you got to see that the rooms you enter, the subjective conclusions and considerations, pretty much the walls of your imagination. Behind those walls is not known. The only reason the subconscious can be really truly considered and studied is because man has dream states. Because there seems to be a living part to the mind, even when the body is asleep, the mind can still do something, you know? I had, I had a dream where in the dream, I'll share it. It wasn't a pleasant dream. But in the dream, I was running and then I uh, fall down. And then there's this army moving and I feel like I'm getting stomped on by this army. But I don't, of course, feel anything. It's just the, the fear is there in the dream. I wake up from the dream and I notice that it's like, okay, there's there's something there's something going on where the mind still lives some sort of life when the body is inactive. Now, when the body is active, is the mind still able to live that extra life? And when we think about imagination, we kind of get a suggestion of that. And what I find creativity is, is knowledge expanding into the unknown, literally uh, a satellite going uh, beyond our atmosphere. That's creativity, guys. (laughs) Exploration um, is uh, is as rewarding as the honest effort takes you. All right, guys, my attention went to the chat section, and uh, that's a beautiful comment. Thank you, Mona. I find life is uh, going to become more rhythmic, and our consciousness is going to become like a surfboard on a wave. There is a freedom in in our subjective realms that is overwhelming once we pass the sort of uh, simulated world of limited belief. Now, so many people around the world I notice, and it's kind of like a... Uh, a movement against the sober state but it's it's um in ancient times like certain shamans would psychedelically change their perspective and in this life i've spoken to many people who have kind of like some of them who have who have experienced this and uh i wondered what what was what called them to it and it was always about it's as if they were hunting for a new experience it's like the same effort of the hunter gatherer that wanted to hunt like buffalo or or something (laughs) the same like sniper like coordination you know is now going to a subjective value 
I find that, what, what does that mean? That means it's like when your perception changes, the speed of thought and the, its multidimensionality also changes, right? And now I'm kind of trying to approach this in the conscious state. So life became first kind of like, all right, you can draw whatever picture you like. Then it became, okay, so what, regardless of whatever picture I draw, there's, there's more to it. The unknown dimensions come in. Those unknown dimensions, eventually, this is why I'm saying life is so kind of profound, uh, because so much is still unexplored. Like that moment in the Game of Thrones show where it was like, you know nothing, Jon Snow. It's not just Jon Snow, guys. It's the whole world. <laughs> freedom is the greatest intelligence. Because without freedom, you can't experience your intelligence. Life has to quickly be the inner dim dimensions should become very... It should become very quiet behind your eyes if you want after some point because of the, um, how would I say it? It's a, it's a difficult situation. It's like there's so many eyes on this planet. That after some point, it's like, we got to be willing to step out of uh, pretty much the whole species has boxes over its head. So for some people, the boxes become transparent. When they become transparent, it doesn't mean the box is gone. It's just that they have, they have had a, a glimpse of beyond the limits of their own belief. Anytime that happens, the humility of the experiencer becomes simultaneous and then life becomes simple. So I have this thing where I kind of like, I find like I, my eyes opened up to this world as a designer first than anything else. That means I, before I learned language, I was looking at design. And as a designer, there is a view where when something complex occurs, you navigate simply. When something simple happens, you feel the, you, you, you can act in complex ways. You know, it's kind of like your intuition becomes just your vision at some point. You can say the intuition is the vision of the subconscious mind if you wanted to consider something like that. <clears throat> the mind is simply the bridge between the body and the soul. The soul is pure unknown. The body is pure known. The mind is, uh, what you gonna do? Sometimes known, sometimes unknown. <laughs> I chose this uh, random picture as the wallpaper, by the way. Because I have had random moments like that in my life where I've just sat down in the world and wanted to hear the voice of the moment. The voice of the moment is not even conceptual. It's just you even imagine becoming so sensitive that like it, it's easier to kind of notice thoughts changing. It is not a, as easy to notice emotions changing. Right. So what that means is it's like this is the fascinating thing that society will never have a pure emotional stability because every person's value system is different. So what that means is if it, you, your value system, let's say you're in a certain cultural program. So let's say <clears throat> your eyes open anywhere in the world, somewhere in the world. OK, so there's a cultural program to the environment. So that cultural program, either you're raised in it or you join it and eventually after some point you become a participant in that worldview, you know, in that cultural domain. 
you you pretty much um it's called it's like survival of the fittest archetype <laughs> not survival of the fittest being you know it's it becomes survival of the fittest image it's like what images are being chosen A pure moment with the cosmos that you have awakened in. Any time in, in, in the, there has been, how can I tell you, there has always been after, like here's what happens in this life. I've, at least to how far my eyes have opened to it. There is order. This order can become chaotic or it can become more ordered. Now, the thing is, in life, things break easier than they are built. So, order takes longer, but chaos can instantly break it apart. Now, in life, when the inner self breaks in a, in, in, based on an intense experience, when the inner self breaks, the person can't lie to themselves. That means they can't be a thought to themselves. They're noticing that the witness is present. There is something that it's like the sensory data is uh, either living through us or we are living through it. <clears throat> you can even say it's, it's a profound thing. They should tell children in school about this. The whole, you know, I, I, ho I hope one day in schools they teach about the subjective evolution. How the person, in some sense, raised themselves from the dirt of the, their mind's attempt to contemplate. You see, it's, uh, we, in order to speak about something, it has to be separate to you it, so you can see it in a world. It's fascinating. The human being is uh, nature's artwork. And this art is continuous. So one thing that human beings should be great for is the incredible, vast, creative potential. Do you know how many human beings will be born in the future that none of us will be able to even fathom or glimpse their inner states? Do you know how many eyes are open on this planet that are walking in worlds? And so externally, we have to find a common denominator. It's this whole kind of, I, I have to constantly result, um, lead myself towards the story because it's, it's really where humanity is, that the Tower of Babylon story. <clears throat> it comes to us, um, I think, from Christianity. But the, the story is that all the human beings in the world gather around. And when they gather around, they decide to build this tower that reaches the heavens to in some sense reach the ultimate heavenly state or whatnot. And so these human beings, they're speaking, they're united under one language and they go along and they start. <clears throat> As the tower reaches closer and closer, one of the gods is like about to throw lightning and the, one of the other gods is like, hey man, let me show you a classier way to do things. <laughs> the, the other, the other god suddenly looks at man and with a snap of his finger, suddenly human beings are all speaking different languages. And therefore they can no longer build, continue to build the structure because opposition occurs. It was pretty much the gods divided man into different languages and pretty much conquered their realms by making them individual selfish. You know, it's kind of like this idea that eventually any sort of living conscious archetype will have to consider an environment. That environment will be a part of the moment, kind of being the mind, right? So it's kind of realizing that there can be certain states. A lot of beings on this planet experience, especially those who go towards bhakti yoga or devotional practices. What does that mean, devotional practices? Devotional practices means the person feels... There is no other way, but if they can do something, it's part, like, how can I tell you? It's a, it's a sort of, um, 
love to an ultimate archetype, feel, feeling like you are a child of existence. I don't know how to say it, but we humanity has to eventually have, I, like, I expect like the United Nations to have a philosophical kind of department where all the philosophers from different nations have gathered around to kind of speak about the cultural values that suggest the people's behavior. Because it, I find it fascinating that in life, really, <clears throat> it's like every person is in their own room, but all our rooms are in the same room. I feel like trying to share something <clears throat> more of my, like, I want to tell you how I've kind of experienced this collective uh, field rhythmically. You see, like, let's say, I think this was in 2013. I was um, raking, believe it or not, leaves in the yard. And for the first time, I remember it was the first time I started to, for the first time, poetry became uh, opened up in my mind. And so I'm raking and I suddenly like hear these, like in my mind, I'm, I'm, I'm like, suddenly the thoughts of these sentences arise. And these sentences are like these, I don't, I don't remember them exactly, but it was something about like the temple of compassion being the moment or something. And I remember I'm like just raking leaves and tears are coming from my eyes. <laughs> And it's a sunny day, you know what I mean? I'm just like raking leaves and like divine, like emo like blissful emotions are coming. And for the first time, I begin to see that it's not about, believe it or not, intelligence being individual. It's about how much one can trust the moment to work with the cosmic flow. You can say a mind that can fathom, can, like generate a problem, it can also, it's like by one existing, the other is permitted. <clears throat> what does that mean? That means if we look at this cosmos and we're like, all right, let's look at this evolutionary landscape, we see it suddenly individual creatures were made. But it's not too far of an idea to consider that there's also collective, the opposite could be potentially true. Learning to feel the world that you are existing in is just like a next level ability on its own. Finding a way to have your inner dimensions uh, accept the moment kind of liberates your external movement. That means you got to realize like I, I, I've kind of like... Sometimes when I speak, I feel these rhythms. And what are these rhythms? They're visions. And what are these visions? It is the movement of my attention in a subjective landscape where some of the images are inspired by my, my memory and some of it is inspired by what, what, what else my memory could be. So if you were a person who had access to, let's say, a limited amount of memories, those memories can be sequenced in so many like ways. Do you know? So what I mean by that is eventually, to be honest, this is this is something about uh, the behind the scenes, uh, behind the scenes of the advanced communicate. What that means is advanced communication appears uh, to the uh, to the common as uh, an endless flow. It's like in the effort of action, we find the momentum of thought into matter.
It's kind of like imagine waking up every day and somebody asking you, who are you? And you write a sentence about who you are. Then you wake up the next day, write another sentence. Then you wake up the next day, write another sentence. Eventually, after some point, you'll be like, okay, I'm none of these sentences. You know? So you snap out of this kind of mode that a sort of sub, like context of a subjective image should, I, I should define you. We have to somehow care for our species without losing sight that the idea is that every member of civilization at least uh, advances. I find the greatest sort of evolution of government in the future will just be a resource provider. Because it's the, the society that a person is alive in, it's literally the story they live in. For example, when the streets of a nation are like, um, it's not beautiful, you know, then it's, it's as if like, then the person says in some sense, like, um, what, is, what is the nation doing? You know, there were certain societies, the Medici family, back in the day, kind of, they were, they were like the rich guys in town. And uh, they had this idea that society should be an incredible, beautiful place. Because if the environment is beautiful, the citizen will feel beautiful. And if the citizen feels beautiful, beautiful that beauty is actually coming from freedom. There's a beauty that is from a free being. That means it has nothing to do with image. It's just like contentment with, a, with the unknown presence of self. More than ever, now is the time to communicate. And what's going to happen is it's like, rather than it becoming a sort of market of ideology, it should become a sort of museum of ideology. You know, I was walking in downtown, <laughs> downtown uh, Toronto. <clears throat> and as I was walking, I looked at the different street signs and I saw food, 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 internet cafe, food. <laughs> Grocery store, clothing, clothing, clothing. <laughs> and I was just like looking at the stores and I was looking at the streets. And the first idea was like, gosh, these streets are, t they should be much, the sidewalk should be much larger. Do you know? And then eventually I realized it's that we, by us giving a financial value to land, we sacrificed its external elegance for its kind of value. So life is becoming messy simply because uh, there is a sort of jungle of a financial game. Now we have to kind of, I remember seeing this picture on Facebook that literally made me laugh for maybe like five seconds, you know? <laughs> you know? Like, like the, in that five seconds, I had maybe like three bursts of laughter, you know? <laughs> and what it was, was it was just a picture it was this meme, this picture of the planet Earth in, from space, like an aerial view. And above it, it said trillions of dollars in debt. <laughs> and it's like, guys, this, this tiny pebble in a light beam has trillions of dollars in debt. And, what it, and we are considering that it's our subjective attention keeping value. Do you know what that means? That means a person can look at any object and be like, whoa, this could have been called any other name other than the name it's given. So we find the freedom of uh, connecting the subjective symbology to the objective phenomenology. So this freedom, you find that freedom between there, then your mind opens throughout the day. And there's this thing that you have to realize so many people, it's not that they are, they are strong people functioning in society, but their inner child feels judged by society. <laughs> what does that mean, their inner child? That means where the true values that their actual wonder of life dwells in is not being activated in the environment they're living. We have to consider what is the option. It's like we want an advanced civilization or not. If we want an advanced civilization, we have to study collective uh, um, movements. 
internal collective movements. Language is a massive internal co collective movement. You know, social media has even made it more possible. I find what Mark Zuckerberg did was as important as the, in the internet being created. The significance of what he did, because he gave a voice to many people who in some sense you see this life i think people have a like just like how some people say there's a love and hate relationship i think there's a chaos and ordered relationship you know and people in life sometimes they might go in a chaotic relationship and they could do nothing about their external condition but there's this inner kind of feeling and emotion whatever but at least social media became kind of like a poet's pen for for the kind of turbulent mind so what I find was it's like people have to consider Facebook. I mean, like, okay, it's advertising whole situation. That's another argument. But I'm saying like <laughs> Facebook was massive therapy for the species. Social media is massive therapy because the human being is always considering continuity. And because its mind is kind of obsessed with a sort of continuity, this obsession with continuity causes the person to eventually realize what is it that can, is, that can continue from the mind of the person. It's the voice. It's the image. It's the self. So eventually, after some point, I think it's like the reason so many people are communicating is because there are worlds unseen behind our eyes. And it's our efforts to bring those out. So this is why philosophers were, in some sense, um, the first pilots into, believe it or not, the linguistic simulation. <clears throat> if life is complex, and that brings about a certain emotion in the person, it can also be simple. After some point, you'll see everything is phenomenology being observed. Just look at something in the room that you're in right now. Just anything. Look at something, but just look at one thing. And just keep looking at it. And you'll eventually notice it's attention to form. So consciousness can only be considered if there is a world for it to be in. Kind of like that whole philosophical argument, if a tree falls in a forest where there's nobody there, did the tree fall? Like when there's no consciousness of it, can it be retained? Can it be considered? And so there are limits to language and there are limits to the sensory perception. But there is also an unknown that could potentially be limitless. We have no idea what kind of creatures we are. One thing we're certain of that we change. But how we change, how we can change... All the ways that things change. <sighs> you know, I eventually realized that the only thing humanity needs is a mirror. I search for a truth to only realize the limits of my own truths. I search for the illusion to realize my, the limits of my own interpretation on the illusion. I eventually found myself ideologically alone. What that means is I noticed there's something strange going on and so I took in the, the whole world as a simulation. So when I took the world as a simulation, something strange happened. That for a second my the future stopped projecting but the past and the present was projecting and as I was kind of like sitting in that moment it was as if I was not I was existing in the present moment but I, I was also existing behind my eyes in those memories and it's fascinating because I find what it is is the experience is making an impression just like how you look at something and close your eyes and you see like a subtle kind of uh, I don't know, behind your eyes in that pitch black abyss, you see the outline of what you were looking at. So it's something like that too, I think. That metaphor can be seen like that. I remember finding myself kind of sitting at my porch. This was like, um, I don't know, last summer. And last, last summer. And... 
in that moment, I just sat down. I was just sitting alone. I had a cup of tea and I was just sitting there. And for a moment, I just wondered what would the, wor the, the most chaotic version of me look like? I'm, I'm, I was wondering in that moment. And then I wondered what would the most chaotic version of me, uh, sorry, what would the most ordered version of me look like? And so I was like sitting there on the porch and I could see my mind could visualize both those versions right there beside me. And for a second, it was as if I felt like the worst part of me and the best part of me and the me that is here now were like a triangle. We're all connected. Any, in any way the moment is categorized, all those dimensions can be seen as one. Oneness is literally the doorway to emptiness. So you can say those people who suddenly step out, go beyond the language threshold, what happens is like literally um, experientially, the, the experiencer becomes free from being identified with the object and subject of observance. Something like that. In the Diamond Sutra it says, Keep your mind alive and free without abiding in anywhere or anything. Another way I think what like what the vision that that sentence comes from Let's move on. <laughs>
So there's an objective component, right? I call this the objective self, the, bo the biological body, and the objective self is in the objective realm, okay? Now there is a subjective, there's a subjective uh, self, and now that subjective self is in a subjective realm, okay? So the subjective realm is more free. It has to do with awareness first, then, then phenomenology. So what does that mean? That means the experience of the moment is like either stuff first then awareness or awareness first then stuff that's pretty much all the, like, human human all human psychology has it comes to this crossroad um some people will say if i live for the species how will i live for myself and this is why i kind of notice it's as if like the mind has a voice and if that voice can be turned into a book it's like every human being should be commanded by like their civilization to share their experience of their journey in this life not per se to just write a biography but to also write their imagination to journal their imagination and to share this hopefully at some database in the future that's going to open up for people's like like every person's life, their book is going to be on a shelf. The book of what their mind contributed, you know? Because it's like more than ever, the inner realms require more expression. This is why creative fields are suddenly on the rise, especially with automation coming in. It's like, what is it? Like in 50 years, <laughs> 50 years, man's not going to be doing much. So it's going to be internal phenomenology. So what does that mean? That means that technology is replacing what we had to bio, like biologically do for ourselves. Because this is happening, the person is now, the biological being is becoming less active. And now the creature is becoming more of a mental entity. Now this mental entity eventually will feel as if its biological body is not perfect and so it's going to try to extend its consciousness through technology so there's this argument kind of like it's like we thought it, there's a spirit in the machine now it's kind of different we're trying to see if we can connect the spirit to the machine if consciousness can continue through digital means or whatever right <clears throat> now i i have considered that what the biological being a self is 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 an antenna and what the subjective self is, is what that antenna receives. And it's a strange antenna that also expresses at the same time. And every human being, you'll just notice it after some point. It's like, listen from the past, but um, uh, act from the future. <laughs> um Mohana, I'm I'm looking at the chat. You know, um, there is this idea, yeah, yeah. It's kind of like can like the candle is going to feel like if the moths get too close, it's going to burn them. Do you know? But it's like life is eventually contentment with experience. And the inner and outer realm is a relationship that can be experienced in human form. Beyond human form, it's not per se just dual. You know, you can say um, once the being truly um, moves beyond the dualistic dimension of phenomenology of how life is being seen as kind of like um, polarized. I think eventually... Our minds, well, it's kind of strange, but it's like, how, how intense would it be if we are all kind of the mind of the universal sect? <laughs> you know, so, so it's like, uh, I don't know, but I, I know that where things are going, it's like we need to be able to pilot in silence and stillness and also movement and noise. So once the inconceivable is truly confronted, one actually begins caring for their limitations. When you're no longer taunted by what you don't know, but you're fascinated by it. That's when vision gains like uh, efficient momentum. So, <laughs> so anyways, guys, thanks for listening and tuning in. Um, something that I've kind of decided to share um, recommend to the viewers is that um, 
get a bunch of paper, put it on uh, like a stack of paper or something, and put it on a table that you pass by often. And put a pen on top of that stack of paper. And don't pick up the pen until there is something important. Important enough that if you forget it, you're like, oh my God, I should have written this down. And begin having a relationship with the mind where it is giving itself freedom to attempt its greatest effort because it, it occurs once. It's like appreciation of the moment always leads to a sort of um, mastery of inner peace. Mastery of inner peace means how consciously and gracefully are you. Like how, how much are you like the order and the chaos and the chaos and the order. The yin-yang kind of abidance. And the cool thing about the yin-yang symbol is that this chaos and order are in one circle. In one moment of being, the chaos and order of <clears throat> our psychology kind of is displayed and projected. So, anyways, guys, thanks for tuning in. And um, when you can write something that fascinates you, you have found uh, a sort of unknown rhythm. I find creative rhythm. So anyways, guys, much blessings and I'll see.